Hey everybody, thanks for joining us again. We're doing this a little bit ahead of time because we're going to be at conference, but you'll probably be watching this at the same time. I'm in the book of Revelation, the seven churches. So if you want to get on your Bible app or your Bible, open it up to Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 8, the church at Smyrna. Jesus said, to the angel of the church at Smyrna, write. So the commission is to the city of Smyrna, which was a lovely city called the Ornament of Asia, the Crown of Asia, the Flower of Asia. This city was a prosperous seaport. It was a big trade city, lots of wealth and commerce. A distinctive was its large Jewish population. It was the first city in Asia to erect a temple to the goddess Roma, and under Domitian was designed for emperor worship. They forced every Roman citizen under the threat of death once a year to burn incense on an altar to Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord. Upon doing that, you'd receive a certificate. If you didn't, it would probably mean death. And many Christians refused. There was a lot of persecution and Christians were killed. The famous church father Polycarp was martyred here. Jesus goes on and says, These are the words of him who was the first and the last and died and came to life again. To each church, Jesus takes a description of himself that fits their particular situation. They were facing death, so Jesus is the one who died but lives. That would give them hope. He was the Lord of their particular situation. In verse 9, he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty yet you are rich. He commends them for the hard time they're going through, the persecution. He uses the word afflicted, which means crushed beneath a weight. It was used of crushing grapes to make wine. And we know that the Bible allows that to happen to us. Acts 14, 22, and of course, John 16, 33, where is he said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be a good cheer. I've overcome the world. Jesus knows about their persecution and suffering, and he cares. He also says that they have poverty. And that particular word is the strongest word in the Greek for poverty. It means to cower. It's abject poverty, destitution, indigence. They had nothing. They lost it all. Their goods were confiscated. Hebrews 10, 34 gives another example of that. Yet they were rich spiritually. He says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Apparently, the Jews, the large Jewish population, were agitated by the authorities against the Christians. They were secret informers. You see, Jews were exempt from emperor worship. They didn't have to go through that. And the authorities there at first thought the Christians were simply a sect of Judaism. And so they were exempt for a while. And the Jewish population there stirred up the authority and said, they have no part of us. They're, they're a sect, a different sect. They're a cult. So it's strong for Jesus to say, they say they are Jews but are not. So they're, they were physically Jews but not spiritually, as Paul says in Romans 2.29. You claim to be a synagogue of God, but really you're a synagogue of Satan. That's a very strong statement. It shouldn't lead us to become anti-Semitic because God's people, the Jews, have a place in his economy and will at the end. Verse 10 says, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Now Jesus gives them a challenge. He warns them that hard times are coming, probably pretty soon. He knows what the devil's up to. He says, some, not all, will be cast into prison. So take note of that some, not every single Christian. And for 10 days, is that a literal time frame or is it just more used for a short time? Remember in the book of Revelation, numbers are almost always symbolic. So I'm understanding this to be not just 10 literal days, but a symbolic period of time that signifies a short period of time. They'll be tested to see if they're loyal to see whom their faith is in, to see if they really believe. Are they willing to die for Christ? 
point a gun at each of the 60 million people who, according to Mr. Gallup's poll, are born-again Christians. Tell them to renounce Christ or have their heads blown off and then take a recount. I think George, like Gideon, would find his troops dwindling. Actually, the price probably wouldn't even have to be so extreme today, threaten to confiscate their TV sets or their telephones, and it would produce the same results. When faith is cheap, it is easily pawned. The covenant promise says there in verse 10, Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Well, I thought they were only going to be put in prison for 10 days. But prison usually meant death. The writer Eusebius says, Some were thrown to wild beasts, some burned to the stake, but the grace given to martyrs was equal to their suffering. And this is in Eusebius's book on Smyrna's martyrs. I mentioned Polycarp before. Let me read something about him. He was probably the church leader at Smyrna who received Christ's second letter. Around 55 AD, Polycarp was brought before the angry citizens of Smyrna and told to swear allegiance to Caesar and blaspheme Christ. The aged bishop refused, answering, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who has saved me? Even threatened with death by wild beasts, Polycarp remained strong in his stand. Finally, he was warned that if he didn't change his mind, he would be killed by fire. Polycarp replied, You threaten me with fire, which burns for an hour and is soon extinguished. But the fire of the future judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly you are ignorant of. But why do you delay? Do whatever you please. With his final declaration still ringing in their ears, the Gentiles and Jews of Smyrna together gathered wood on the Jewish Sabbath and used it to burn Polycarp alive. This saint did not bow to the pressure of the moment, even though he faced a horrible death. You, too, can stand up and persevere for Christ, realizing that your momentary light affliction is producing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. These Christians were promised a crown. The pagans worshipped the gods of their day, wearing garland flower crown around their heads. The athletes wore these wreaths. Contrast that with the crown Christ gives, the joy of eternal life, even if martyred. Someone said, my crown is neither now or ever in the accumulation of things, but in the pure gold of character, which flows out of the refining fires of struggle and tribulation. The city of Smyrna sat on top of a hill. There was a rounded street, a circular street, there was the main street of town that went in a circle around the top of the hill. It was called the Golden Street. So it looked like a crown, this city, on top of a hill. The people there would walk on real golden streets and wear a real crown on their head. In verse 11, the co covenant promise says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. See how the reward fits the circumstances? Persecuted and martyred, but not hurt by the second death, which it says later in the book of Revelation is hell. Born twice, die once. Born once, die twice. The ultimate... Is it enough to get through one trouble only to have another coming? After cycle after cycle, is it rewarding enough just to get out of trouble? Is there meant to be more? Like an anticipating picked up pace that's drawing us forward. Larger than just getting out of life's problems. Something exciting that keeps us marching forward with accelerating steps. We know this is offered from God. The week before, there was a few thoughts on perfected love. Actually, to be told you're clean or the resurrection. 
last week also just realizing the direction of life for us is meant to be co-comprehending with all the other saints the fathomless love extending boundaries dimensions pressing both outward for us and also inward taking ground within us fullness of love that vision pressing in and pressing on without a vision the people perish I think is true so another full-fledged vision we see in scripture is what Paul says in Philippians 3 the upward calling in Christ Jesus such a vision permits for all loss like what Ed's sharing this upward way developing that would sweep us up out of the clutter of the problems of each day circumstances plus the damage we feel does within us to break us an exciting life offered to sweep up our hearts for up so the full passage of this in Philippians 3 that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead not that I had already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And it's that last verse to just kind of take piece by piece the upward call did you ever think there's really a, a real road that's upward like taking Elijah up the technical word is a decisive appeal of God to the soul which is made in Christ Jesus to make him his own so the calling for Paul was huge to be made an apostle but just to be made a Christian his own, quote, spiritual experience, celestial, at once in origin, operation, and final issue. So in the epistles, the words call and calling denote not merely an external, but an internal. Those who have listened and responded to this calling are converted, as we hear in um, Romans 8.30. Predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also glorified. Those he justified, he also justified, he also glorified. So if we listen and responded to this, we are called through this gospel to share in the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. For Thessalonians 2.14, as is in Hebrews 3.1, Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, Set your focus on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. So this upward calling does include the goal, which would mean the end. Those who endure to the end, like Ed is speaking here. The goal, well, we just heard the apostle and high priest of our calling. The Greek word is like, the, and I didn't realize this, is like the word mark, which is, was more used in archery than of racing. So what we are facing is marked as a target. We are moving to the mark. We are moving mark words. I haste towards the prize, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24. The runners run, but only one gets the prize. Rise, run in such a way as to get the prize. The prize we see initially, or um, ironically with Ed, is the crown. James 1 12 blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him then repeating what Ed just said the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and, will, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days be faithful even to the point of death and I will give you life as your victor's crown Paul in 2 Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to also to all who love is appearing. So Paul knew he had been apprehended by God through the gospel to secure this crown. It is placed before him and above him in heaven. We are seeming to merely hear his reach for it. 
for it to be his he will not faint or tire or look backward it's going to demand his highest efforts and he realizes it is worth everything i run with a definite aim not as uncertainty and that aim is to win the prize as he said in first corinthians 9 paul can say i so run the caller of god in christ jesus is the father who has saved us and called us to a holy life 2 Timothy 1 9, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, 1 Peter 5 10, and the call is in the Son, in Jesus. Ephesians 1 9 through 10, the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Jesus Christ, it says, Revelations 1, 6, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of, ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom. Mark words, upwards, upward call, heavenly. Are you and I hearing this call in our daily life? Are we feeling this upward sweep that Paul did? It is from heaven and to heaven. Heaven invites us to heaven. It is literally upward, upper, meaning the skies. So through the New Testament, you hear high above up. I, or, well, it means high above up. I am from above. Jesus lifted his eyes above. There are wonders in heaven above. Jerusalem, which is above, is free and is the mother of us all. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. There is definitely an upward way going on. Let's join in. Let's get scooped up. So an interesting passage with this that I guess has been dissected. Proverbs 15, 24, the way of life, the way of life is above to the wise or the prudent. So they walk, the path they walk is in things above. The path all along for them is upward. The way even to get to above is from above. The very way of life. And we recognize way to be Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Another version, the path of life is upward for the prudent that he may turn away from Sheol beneath. So Jesus the way as the apostle high priest forerunner to the goal prize inheritance. So here, the way, the path, the walk, and the daily that we have before us is from above to walk. Let's take this into our daily. Like Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, be it upwards, there your heart will be also. Proverbs 12, 28 says, in the, path of right, in the path of righteousness is life, and in its pathway there is no death. So can we see, to get on this pathway that Paul could see, for those that have, they see it as their right, and they see they can go into it. Their course goes right into it, and they're going to actively respond. It is from above that Paul senses and lives by the mark of the upward call and becomes that way of life for him, ending up at the above, an upward way. We have something more than just pull us out of our troubles. Praise the Lord. In our vision of trouble, there's so much more we can join. Calling to salvation in Christ, which, is co which coming from heaven invites us to heaven. Our, our ground for living we will know both on earth and in heaven, but it's all ground that Christ apprehended and said, all authority has been given to me. Christ had apprehended Paul for it. He has you and me. Paul was fully possessed and agreeing with all that was aimed for him. How can you and I shrink to, to decide anything less? So for all of us, press, run, Set him before us as our guide. Hope in heaven where our inheritance is. Like, again, Hebrews 3, 1. Therefore, holy brothers who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, 
So let's come unto him who said, come unto me. And I love this, um, this quote. It, it, the calling is in the person of Christ. So come to where that vision is, where, quote, the eye outstrips and draws onward the body, the hand, the foot. This is what we need vision for. It becomes effectual. It becomes our orthodoxy as Orthodoxy isn't just words on a page. It's rather ortho, like orthodontist, and glory is dox. There's a right path of glory which beckons us glory to glory. Mark words upwards heavenly. He always leads us in his triumphal procession. We are in that upward scooping. Okay. Let's pray. Oh, Father, would you... Let us see just a glimpse of your glory, how great you are, what the future holds for us, and that whatever we may have to suffer and go through on this earth, it won't be able to be compared with the glory that we'll have then with you. Strengthen us for the task at hand, in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed.